Dragons, the creatures of myth and legends that have haunted many cultures, from being revered to being feared. These beasts of myth were used to anoint kings and heroes alike, and were a symbol of the unstoppable forces of nature, especially for those that dwelled in the waters of the deep. These sea dragons were believed to hunt the largest whales, cause typhoons and tsunamis, and drag even the most experienced sailors to a watery grave. These dragons are not the sea dragons we are talking about today. Hello, animal lovers. Welcome to the Zoology Girl channel and to another episode of the series Species Summary. I am your host, Strawbebe, and today, instead of dragons of myth and legends, we will turn our focus on something much smaller and, well, for you, maybe, underwhelming. But I consider them just as badass as any mythical dragon. Let's get started, shall we? Okay, so last episode we started with class for the seals. But fish are a bit more complicated, so we're going to have to differentiate a bit more. Not all fish fit under one class, like mammals or birds do. Above class, you've got fish separated out by whether or not they have a jaw, agnatha and natha stomata. Sea dragons are technically a jawed fish, despite not really having a functioning one anymore. The bone is there, but it's mostly fused together and isn't really a jaw anymore, just a tube for suction like a vacuum hose. Next is whether they have cartilage, skeletons, or bones. Sea dragons, given their bony plating, are definitely a bony fish, so they fall under Osterichthys. Then we ask the question if the fish has lobed fins, like lungfish or ray fins, like most other fish. Most other fish. Sea dragons barely have functioning fins, but they are indeed rayed, so they fall under Actinopterygy. From there, they fall into the clade of Neopterygy because they have more derived traits, particularly in the fin structure, than, say, paddlefish or sturgeons, who have more ancestral traits. To be honest, you can't really get more derived than a sea dragon. I mean, just look at it. They don't even resemble a typical fish. And if you hadn't been taught that they were a fish, you might assume, on first glance, they were... I don't know, some kind of crustacean or a reptile or a relative of a starfish, a living example of a fairy, or I don't know, maybe even an alien. Finally, finally we get into class. Or maybe we were there two clades ago. Ugh, the taxonomy of fish is so messed up that some sources can't even seem to agree with each other on what the class is. But I digress. The class, according to my more credible sources, is teleostei, which is pretty much everything except for gar and bowfin. I know my descriptions have been kind of vague thus far, but honestly, fish classification is difficult as there are so many of them. They're the oldest group of vertebrates, some are less related to each other than they are to frogs, our particular species today happens to be in the largest group, and that for some cases, including this species, the classification requirements only applied to the ancestors of the animals. It's easier to define these groups by what they aren't than what they are. I might go into further detail if I ever do a purely taxonomic video. We're skipping superorder because it's really ill-defined and it's basically just copy-paste of actinopterygy and going straight to order. Gasterosteriforms include sticklebacks and pipefish and everything closely related to pipefish. One of the key features of this group is the tough dermal plates on the body, hearkening back to all those Devonian fish with bony plates despite having very little relation to them, proving that evolution, just like fashion, tends to cycle trends. Skipping suborder again, Cygnathidae is the family leafies are from and includes the pipefish, seahorse, and sea dragons. All these animals are lumped together because they decided to say, screw having a working jaw. Cygnathinae is the subfamily and just kicks seahorses out of the group. Phycoderus is the genus of the leafies, which they are once again the only member of. And the species name is Equis. <sighs> well, that took a lot, but it wasn't that bad. Okay, 
Okay, because of what happened with the taxonomy section, I'll try not to rant here. Sea dragon anatomy is very similar to that of seahorses. They've got bony plates all over their body, forming ring-like structures. Their eyes can move independently of one another, and their gills are located behind their eyes. Their pectoral fins are located on their necks, and the dorsal fin is on their tail. They grow about 14 inches long at maximum, which is fairly big for a seahorse, but minuscule compared to many other kinds of fish. They can also live for up to 10 years. In terms of strength, these animals are not powerful swimmers at all. They have no use for their tails for swimming, as it's very rigid, and mostly rely on their thin pectoral and dorsal fins to move. They can't swim fast, and in fact can barely move more than a few meters per hour. They are pretty much entirely at the mercy of the waves, unable to even cling to the sea vegetation to keep them safe, unlike their seahorse relatives. This results in a lot of them ending up dead on the shores after a storm. Despite this, they have a good inborn navigational skills and can make it back to their home habitat fairly easily if the waves are forgiving. Despite their slowness, these animals are actually carnivores. Yes, you heard me right. Hey, I guess that does mean they actually do have something in common with actual dragons. Newborns mostly feed on zooplankton, while adults eat small crustaceans and baby fish floating in the water. They are able to do this thanks to their mouth working a bit like a vacuum suction tube. Well, okay, maybe not that violently powerful. <laughs> More like a straw. Anyways, they slurp up their near-microscopic prey as they gently float through their habitat. While newborn sea dragons easily get picked off by larger animals, adults rarely do. This is due almost entirely to their amazing camouflage. The leaf-like appendages and their coloration make them blend near seamlessly into their habitat. Unfortunately, there is, relatively speaking, very little published research about leafies and thus even less behavioral research done with them. There are two main areas about their behavior that we do know about, defense and mating. As previously stated, these animals are some of the slowest moving things in the ocean and are fragile as a toothpick. They also gave up their jaws a long time ago in order to be able to suck up tiny shrimp all day. This can be a real problem when living anywhere with plenty of bigger fish with sharp pointy teeth, let alone the land of a thousand killers where even the snails are deadly, aka Australia. This would make you easy pickings for everything from sea snakes, to sharks, to rays, to jellies, to literally anything else that craves meat. Although, I still don't know why anyone would want to eat what is essentially a living toothpick, but now I'm just going off on a tangent and should really get to my point. As a prey item, if you can't run and you can't fight back and you don't have anyone else looking out for you, what do you do to stay alive? The answer is, you hide. As previously mentioned, they have one of the best camouflage methods among vertebrates, but this isn't just due to its coloration and shape but also its movements. It slowly moves in the water and has a habit of rocking in a specific way that makes it look like a piece of seaweed just floating in the current, fooling both predators and prey. They can even have the ability to change color from a greenish yellow to a brownish red based on their environment to better suit its habitat. They prefer kelp-rich areas of reefs and generally live in depths between four to 12 meters, though can be found deeper and are generally daytime active only. As for mating, once a year these fish gather together and pair off into males and females to perform a mirroring mating dance where they swim in sync with each other. If done successfully, they mate. Little is known about if dragons form multiple pair bonds or are promiscuous during breeding. But what is known, like seahorses, male leafies look after the young as the eggs are attached to a brood patch on their tails. However, once they are finished developing and hatch, they are completely independent, ready to take on the world. I mean, most are probably going to get eaten because they're so tiny, but the ones that do survive are ready to take on the world. The males work hard to take care of the eggs, but if spooked, they may drop them. So yeah, don't bug male sea dragons carrying eggs.
The family sea dragons came from, first evolved about 45 million years ago, meaning they were none during the time of the dinosaurs, but they did manage to live through several ice ages. Much of the evolutionary history of these animals is still unknown, and while some aboriginal or seafaring people may have known about them prior to Western intervention, they were first scientifically described in 1865 by a taxonomist named Albert Gunther. He originally dubbed them Phylopteryx equis, putting them in the same genus as the common, or weedy, sea dragon, and the recently discovered ruby sea dragon, but this was later revised. They were dubbed the name dragon due to their fairly obvious resemblance to the mythical Chinese river dragons. Like Chinese dragons of myth, they are symbols of good luck. Due to human activity by pollution, habitat lost, theft from their habitats by collectors, and being hunted for uses in alternative medicine, these animals became very endangered for a while. Thankfully, starting in 1987, these animals became a protected species in the state of South Australia, and by the 1990s, no developmental project in the region could be put through without consideration being put towards the species' health and well-being. They are so beloved that they are a symbol of marine life in South Australia, and even have a biennial festival held in their honor called Festival Florie, which takes place in mid-April. If you were thinking about owning one of these creatures, you really should think again. It is extremely illegal to take them from the wild. The only way to obtain one legally is from a captive breeding stock, and considering that they both don't breed well in captivity and it takes over $18,000 a year to care for them, unless you're a multi-millionaire, having one of these guys as a pet is nearly impossible. And the legal captive population is almost entirely located within accredited zoos and aquariums. However, you can always scuba dive with them in Australia if you really want to get a closer look at them, which frankly is going to be a lot cheaper. Due to conservation efforts, these animals have gone from endangered to just near threatened, and with continued protection, they may continue to thrive. Although, as with many marine animals, increased global warming is causing problems for these cool water dwelling animals. So you may be wondering, Straw Bebe, this is all awesome, but you insisted these animals were badass, and I see nothing badass about them. They aren't apex predators, they don't have an impenetrable defense, and can't even swim that fast. How are they badass? And to that, my friend, I say, were you listening at all? Yeah, these animals aren't the toughest in the world, but they've managed to survive in spite of that. By all means, these creatures are incredibly vulnerable, yet have managed to survive on a one-trick defense for thousands, if not millions of years. These guys are one of the ultimate underdogs of the animal world and nearly faced extinction, but were able to not only survive that, but rebuild their population with a little help. And honestly, that's pretty badass in my book. So next time you're feeling down, take a page from these guys, and remember, life is never about being the best, but hanging in there the best you can. And that's something to be proud of. Thanks for watching, everyone. Hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, please subscribe, and maybe consider donating to my Patreon. Also, special thanks to Val for letting me borrow her OC for this video. If you want more information on her and her art, check out the information in the description. Most importantly, though, have a great day.